Hey, well, good morning. Look to somebody beside you and say, I survived week one of school starting back. Go ahead and tell somebody, if you've got kids, you have survived week one of, uh, of school starting back. And, and we want to welcome you. This is uh, week one of a new series called Grace. Um, grace is something that uh, we all want when we make mistakes, but we don't often want to give when someone else does. Right? It's something that we often hang on to when someone else does something against us, but it's something that we want to receive whenever we make the mistake ourselves. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about what it means to, 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 to receive grace, what it means to, to give grace to other people uh, around us um, when they make mistakes, and, and what that looks like for you and what that looks like for me and, and things that we deserve you know, as a result of our sinful nature, but yet, you know, what we receive in spite of what we, we deserve. And so we're going to look at that together. I know it's been a crazy week. Um, how many of you have kids that are in school right now? Raise your hand with me. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. It's been a crazy week. So, so this is Brittany's first year um, teaching in the school system as, as a, as, with her own class as an educator. And so it was very interesting because week one, she's going to school and she's like, oh yeah, by the way, because you know, we're on yellow right now, um, the kids are going to be home with you uh, a couple of days a week. Actually, three days a week out of the two. And so she went to school, and then the kids were there two days, and then I had meetings all week. Like every day I had meetings I had to be in. And so I was doing these video conference meetings trying to talk with people. And Bentley's coming in going, Dad, can you help me with this? I don't understand. And then, you know, Briggs is coming in and, and, and hey, Dad, I've got to read this. And then Braden's, you know, older. He's lining up with all of his classes. And so all day for a couple of, a couple of days this week, I've, I've been trying to walk them through that process and, and actually, you know, kind of be there with them at home. And then she's teaching at school. And so she's coming home in the afternoon and I'm like, I'm going to die. I'm not going to make it. Lord Jesus, please help me. And she's like, what? And she's like, you, 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 you can do this. I'm like, I don't think I can survive it. Like, please, Lord, let everybody go back to school. Like, let them all go, go back. I, I mean, it has been crazy. It's been a crazy week, but, um, but it's been challenging. But I, I say that to say this. I know teachers right now are, are trying to adjust, pray for our educators. I know they're trying to adjust taking care of, you know, the kids that are online, also with the kids that are in class with their safety, and also being able to present material to them, and then parents of you that are trying to find someone to help watch your kids, or whether you're doing work from home and watching your kids and making sure they're getting educated and getting what they need and the information they need, and, and you have to stay on top of them, right? I'm like, Briggs, are you done? He's like, yeah, Dad, I'm cool. And then I'm like, are you, let's look at it. He's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I got one more thing I need to do. It's, it's just staying on top, making sure they're getting everything they need to stay up to, to date with everything that's going on. And so it's been an interesting week, and, I, and I've needed to receive some grace, and I needed to give some grace along the way as well to my kids, you know, getting them up in the morning and getting them ready and, and making sure they have lunch and breakfast, and I'm the cafeteria. I'm working, the, I'm working all parts of the duty right now at school, right, with the, with the kids. And so uh, for those of you that are in that, in that mode, God bless you. Uh, we, we're going to lay hands and pray for you um, <laughs> from a distance through this process, uh, but it has been interesting. And uh, we know that, it, that, that things are going to change in the weeks to come as we continue through it. But right now, this is where we are, and we need to pray for those um, who, who work in that, in that field and pray for our kids uh, through that process. Uh, but uh, with all that being said, uh, again, I want to welcome you and thank you for being here as we, we look at week one of, of grace. And this morning, we're going to look at um, what we talk about and the fact that every one of us in here, what we deserve versus what... God gives us. And I think when we begin to realize how blessed we are, it helps us get our focus back where it needs to be. Sometimes we get caught up and we look at things and we miss the fact of the grace that God has given us, the blessings that he has given us that we've received. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to look at um, people who Jesus loved um, who didn't deserve it. People who Jesus extended love to who deserved rejection but received acceptance. People who deserved condemnation but received grace. People who, you know, deserved being counted out, but yet they were given a second chance. And the two that I want to look at, or two people I want to look at this morning um, for us together is the thieves that were on either side of Jesus on the cross. 
Um, I want us to look at that together and, and as we identify with them, and you're going to find a story here that we often talk about at Easter where you've got Jesus is going to the cross, and this is his last moments here on earth in his flesh, and, and he's there, and on each side of him hangs this thief, this individual. And we talk about you know, the thieves, and we talk about Jesus and what he did on the cross for us, but, but I, I want us to be able to identify, and I'm going to ask you a question this morning, and for those watching online, especially for those of you that may watch later in the week, you know, every one of us in this room, every one of us in this room identify with one or the other. We, we're we're going to identify with one of these thieves, every one of us in here, because here's what we know. You may want to write this down. You know, some of us may go, I just don't know about that. But, but this, is, this is truth and this is reality. Everyone's guilty of breaking God's law. Everyone is guilty of breaking God's law. Every one of us in here, everyone that's watching online, we are all guilty at some point or another. We've, we've broken God's law. You know, look at somebody beside you and say, you've broken, you've broken God's law. Go ahead, tell somebody, you have. We, we, we all have. And the thieves, the, when Jesus was on the cross, the thief on either side, both of them had, had broken God's law. Both of them were thieves. Both of them had, making, had made mistakes along the way. Let me ask you a question. Be honest with me. How many of you have ever lied in your life? At some point or another, you, you have lied. I just, I just want you to confess it for a moment. Say, I, I have lied. Go ahead. Raise your hand. All right. We got a church full of sinners in here this morning. All right, let me ask you another question. How many of you have ever cheated on a test? When, I mean, at any point, you looked over and you're like, you know, how many of you ever cheated at some point or you had someone help you through a test? Go ahead, confess it. Don't be all spiritual on me. You know, like, like you cheated, you Googled it, whatever it was, right? I, I, I looked it up. You know, nah, man, I just went abacadabba all the way down, praying that magic would happen and I would pass. Abacadabba, A-B-A-C-A-B-A, abacadabba. You know, what, what, what does that look like for us? We've all, we've all made mistakes. We've, we've cheated. We've lied. I would dare to say at some point or another, most of us have broken even the law of stealing something. Whether you want to confess it or not, maybe you went through the bank and you took the pen and were like, baby, it's my pen now, right? At some point or another, we've all made mistakes. We've all done something that, that, you know, that we're shameful of, or we, we, know that we, we know that we did wrong. Whatever that may look like, let me read this to you and, and encourage you, whoever you are. James chapter 2, verse 10 in the New Living Translation says, For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who's broken all of God's laws. So let me say that again. The person who keeps all the laws. In other words, for someone who keeps all the laws, man, they're almost like your batting average is perfect. They've got like one strikeout. They made one mistake. For someone who has almost a perfect batting average but yet just messed up one time, it's just as guilty as the person who strikes out every time. Just as guilty as the person who continues to, to make mistakes along the way. And so all of us find ourselves in a position where we've all broken God's law at some point or another. You know, whether it's cheated on a test or whether it's lied or, or, or gossiped or maybe coveted, whatever it may be, we've, we've, we, find, we all find ourselves in a position where we've broken God's law. Both thieves on, the thieves on either side of Jesus had broken God's law. They had made some mistakes. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that scripture there says, for the wages of sin, say that with me, the wages of sin is what? Death. And so as a result, if we break God's law, his commandment, if we break the law, we've sinned, and the wages of sin leads to what? Death. And so what that tells us is all of us deserve what? Death, based on the fact of the mistakes that we made, that we can't live a perfect life. And so as a result of that, we need someone to save us. We need someone to rescue us. That's where Jesus going to the cross, paying that price that you and I couldn't pay in order to provide a way for us to be forgiven because the wages of sin is death. But then through Jesus, we have what? Eternal life, right? And so that's, that's why we celebrate Easter. We celebrate the cross and what Jesus did for us. We all deserve it. But the good news is this, is when we talk about the word grace and what grace means as a, as a result of receiving it, something that we don't deserve, but yet God freely gives us that grace, here's the deal. He doesn't have to give us what we deserve. 
As a result of Jesus, we do not have to receive that very thing that we deserve. We deserve death as a result of sin, as a result of the things that we've done. We, we deserve that in our flesh, but as a result of, of what the good news of what Jesus has done for us, we don't have to be dealt what we deserve. We can receive you know, eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. So let's look at these two that are beside Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, and in verses 32 and 33 with me, it says, two other men, both are what? Say that, they're what are they? The criminals were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And so Jesus finds himself surrounded by criminals being crucified on a cross at the place called the skull. And there he was, one on his right and one on his left. Now there was a lot of different ways to execute people. You look at history of a way that, that they would execute criminals, they would take out people who had done wrong. There's a lot of different ways to execute someone, but crucifixion happened to be the most expensive way to bring about execution on somebody's life. You say, well, why was it the most expensive? Because it required several things. The reason it was the most expensive, it required four Roman guards. It required one centurion, so it required manpower. That was very expensive. Why? Because this was something that just didn't last an hour or two, but actually this is a, this is a death that lasted, could last several days. It could last for overnight. It, it could last for a while. And so as a result, it cost to have the Roman guards, the centurion, you know, that, be out there for several days. It was the most expensive way that someone could die as, as, far, as far as being executed. You know, the, 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 the manpower was very high. It, it cost a lot. Um, not only was it the most expensive, but it was the most painful most expensive, most painful, and most publicly humiliating because they would be stripped down to nothing and be put on a cross, be mocked at, and it was a slow, painful death. And so this tells you a lot about who Jesus was hanging next to on the cross. This tells you a lot because what this means is these people wanted them to experience pain because of whatever they had done. Apparently, they had done enough wrong that it caused the Romans, it caused them to want to let it be a slow death, for it to, to take time, for them to put the money into it, to be publicly humiliated, to experience the pain that they would experience. You, this is who you find yourself surrounded by with Jesus on the cross. He's on the cross being crucified along with two criminals who very well deserved to die based on the, the wrong that they had done. And we don't know much about them. We don't know what, the, what all sins they had committed, you know, whether it was murder. We don't, we don't know who they had harmed, who they had stole from. We, we don't know much about their past, but we know this is who Jesus is hanging next to. And it was bad enough for them to spend a lot of money to bring about um, a painful execution. And of course, we know they wanted Jesus there as well to execute him along with these criminals. And so let's look at verse 39. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Like calling him out. Verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you were under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds, what's that word there? Deserve. We're getting what we deserve. Like, we've made the mistakes that, as a result, we deserve this punishment. He says, we, you know, I, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done what? Nothing wrong. So here's what we know. We know that we've all broken God's law at some point or another, we, we make mistakes. Not only that, but here's what I can tell you, as I said earlier, we all identify with one or the other. Everyone in this room, everyone watching online, we are all one of these two thieves that's here with Jesus in this story. 
we all align one way or the other. And so I want us to look at it again, this, this very same moment that I just read to you, where they're both talking to Jesus, having a conversation with him on the cross in their last moments. I want to summarize that, and look at those verses again, and I want us to be able to determine where we are in this story. Like, where, where are you at? Who do you identify with on this cross? Who do you identify with, you know, for those watching online, who do you identify with as we talk about the two and what they, and what they experienced and determine if you're more like thief number one or if you are more like the second thief? Or you, how do you line with that? You know, we don't know their names. We don't know where they're from. We don't know what they did. We don't, we don't know a lot about their past, but there are some things that we do know. Look at verse 39 with me again. What do, what do we know? One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus and said things like this. He said, aren't you the Messiah? He's asking a question. Aren't you the Messiah? Didn't you, didn't you declare yourself as the Messiah? Why don't you do us a favor? Why don't you save yourself and us? You know, look at this mess we're in. Save yourself and us. So what do we, what do we know? We don't know his name. We don't know about all the crimes that he committed. But what do we know? Here's what we know about this guy. He's arrogant. He's arrogant prideful, entitled, doesn't fear God, is rather a smart aleck about the situation. If there's anything about God that he wants, he's like this. Okay, if Jesus, if, if, if you are this Savior, then, then save me too. More of a prideful way to look at it. You know, if, if, if this is who you are, then just include me. If this is what you've done, then, then include me as well. And, and honestly, there are some of us that identify with that. Maybe in your past, maybe no longer, but maybe some of you are like, man, that's where I was at. And maybe for some of you, you're still struggling with some of those things. And so this is what that type of person w would, would respond to. Maybe some of you think this, and, and, and you realize, man, that's kind of where I line up at. You're like, all right. If there is a heaven and hell, I'll say this little prayer that you want me to say just to help me out. If there is a heaven and hell, then, then I'll say this prayer. How did it go? I'll say it. Well, help, help me with the prayer and I'll say it, if that's what gets me to heaven. You, you know, or, or I'll check the box at church because if there's a heaven and hell, I, I want that insurance. Let me just go ahead and check the box. If I need to get baptized, okay, I'll, I'll get baptized. If, if that's what gets me into heaven... Then, then I'll, you know, getting saved or saying this prayer, then I'll say this prayer just in case there is a heaven. I, I, I'll, get, I'll go in the, in the water and get wet and, and say that I was baptized if, if this is what part of identifies me with someone who gets to, to go to heaven. I'll do whatever it takes as far as what you ask me to say or, or you know, in, in that moment, but don't ask anything of me. I, I'll, I'll say the prayer, but don't ask me to do anything. And maybe some identify with that. It's an entitled mindset. I, I, I'm entitled to it if it's there. But don't ask me to do anything in return. You know, it, it's not that he's recognized any guilt, that he's done anything wrong, that this isn't right, and you know, it's, it's, it's more of this just isn't fair, I don't, I don't like this, and, 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 and I want to get out of this if there's a way out of it. So if you want to write this word down, but this is the word that identifies with this person. And it's simple. It's, it's unrepentant. One of the individuals that was beside Jesus was very unrepentant. It, it, it's the same as I said with some of us. Maybe you're like, well, I'll say this prayer just for the sake of appeasing my family or, or for the sake of just because I, I want to I wanna go to heaven if, if I can. But there's really no repentance there. It's unrepentant. It's just it's, it's more out of pride or, or arrogance or entitlement, like I said, really no fear of God or, or no need for a Savior. Completely different. But then look at the response in verse 40 and 41 here. He says, hey, don't you fear God, he said. This was the other thief. Since you are under the same sentence, since you are under the same sentence, he said, we are punished justly, like we deserve what we get, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But his response here is, but this man has done nothing wrong. He's watched Jesus through this whole moment, how Jesus is responding. He realizes Jesus is innocent. 
And he's like, this man's done nothing wrong, and, and, and he's, you know, he doesn't deserve to be here, but we do. As a result, he has a different spirit about him. He has a different way of seeing things. And so instead of being unrepentant, more of a, well, if this is who you are, then do it for me, and prideful, he's on the other side of this. So you write this down. He was repentant. It, it was the opposite of being unrepentant. He's saying, hey, you know, we're broken. We've messed up. And he's willing to humble himself, confess it. He's desperate, realizing he needs forgiveness, realizing he, he needs help. And he feared God. And he said, don't you fear God? Don't, don't you realize where exactly? And he was willing to be repentant. And so every one of us in this room at some point or another, we've identified with one of these two. And even today, we can identify, I've been there, I'm still there, or, or I've given my life to Christ, and I'm in a different position now. But every one of us can identify with these two individuals. And, you know, and as we, we look at this story, and, and we look at the culture in which we live in, we, we look at the, the life that our kids are, are growing up in, and the things that our kids are exposed to, and the and the things that they see, and, and the things that they are involved in. And I, I look back even, you know, as far as me being a kid, going back into the, the 80s and, and, and the 90s, or you go back even further than that, and, and culture has changed drastically. Things that, that my kids are going to experience versus the things that I experienced, or the things that I experienced versus some of the things that some of you in here that are older have experienced. Our culture has drastically changed and, and, and continues to change. And one of the things that we see as we look at culture continuing to gradually change, what we find is, is as it has shifted from a position of being willing to say, hey, I messed up. I really messed up. To being more of this, don't call me a sinner. Don't tell me that I did something bad. I'm not a bad person. Don't tell me that's a sin. Don't tell me what I can and can't do. I'm not a bad person, and this and what I'm doing isn't a sin. It, you're just living in the culture of the past. You're just living in a different cultural time frame. Culturally today, this is no longer sin when it was a sin then. And we begin to try to bring justification for some of the things that we're living in or some of the things that we're doing and try to justify it as no longer sin. And the problem is this, is when we have the mindset, here's, here's where this cultural mindset shifts. And listen, we've all been guilty of this, including myself. Not one of us in here are not guilty of it. We've all been in this position at one point or another. Here's where culture has shifted. As we begin to have access to social media, as we begin to have access more into other people's lives, as we begin to have access to all the things that we have access to, here's what's happened. Our culture has shifted where we begin to compare ourselves to other people versus comparing ourselves to who God says we are and what he's called us to. And so as a result of that, when I begin comparing myself to other people and not to God, it can help me begin to feel good about myself. Well, I may be living in this sin, <laughs> but it's nowhere near as bad as that. I may find myself living in this moment here, but, you know, this is, don't, don't call this sin. When I, when I justify it and, 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 and look at this, this over here, it's nowhere near as bad. I, I'm not posting my junk on social media. At least I'm not, like, letting the world see it. Like, at least I'm, I'm over here. I'm not, like, bringing every. And before you know it, we compare to everyone else instead of comparing ourselves to God. And that's how we begin to live. Go ahead and elbow, elbow somebody right now. Go ahead, do it. Take a moment and elbow if, if, if you're allowed to elbow them. Now, if you're social distancing from them, you can't throw an elbow. But throw the elbow and say, you make me feel good. Go ahead, tell somebody. You, you make me. Now, now, don't go any further than that. Why do you make me feel good? You, you make, but that's what happens. We begin to look at other people's lives and like, man, I feel pretty good compared to that. And, and that's exactly, if we're not careful, we find ourselves in that culture. But here's the problem. Until you recognize yourself as a sinner, you have no need for a savior. Until you recognize yourself as a sinner, until we recognize ourselves as a position of saying, I need help, 
I've made stupid mistakes. Until we recognize ourselves as a sinner, we won't see the need for a Savior. Even though we need it, we're blinded to it and we miss it because of arrogance, full of pride. You know, and if we are arrogant and if we are full of pride, God looks at us and says, I can't help you because you don't see me. You don't see the need. But, but if you come to him with a repentant heart and say, man, I have messed up. Own up to it. Confess it. Then our hearts are opened, and suddenly you become a candidate for his grace when we're willing to confess. And here's what's amazing about God's grace. And I want you to think about this. Maybe you've never thought about it before. But you look at Jesus on the cross, and I want you to picture this. Jesus is on the cross. Thieves are on both sides. Follow me with this. Both thieves were guilty, right? Both of them were guilty of something. Both of them had made some mistakes. Both were equally near to Jesus, right? One in the middle, one on each side. Both of them are guilty. Both of them are equally close to Jesus in physical distance from where they were at. Both saw and heard what happened over those several hours. Both of them saw Jesus being crucified. Both of them heard everything that went on. Both of them experienced that. Both of them suffered severely on the cross as they were drawing their last breaths. Both of them were dying. Both of them needed forgiveness. Both of them experienced all of the same things except one recognized his need and the other one didn't. One recognized his need for forgiveness and the other one did not recognize it. He say, well, how does that relate to me? Simple. As we were in here this morning singing and I was listening to everyone sing and we were singing some songs and talking about his amazing grace and talking about his love and the, the, that he gave his life for us. And as we were singing those songs, you know, in this room this morning, there's two people singing the same song, hearing the same message about God's goodness and his grace. One person is going to look and go, I don't need that stupid religion. I, I, I've got what I need. And the person right next to him is going, I've messed up in my life. I've made some mistakes. And I do need help. I do need his grace. And the good news is, is that the second one, if we have a repentant heart, that, that God, we call on Jesus, that we can be transformed and we can be made new and that we can be forgiven and that we can be transformed. And we receive this grace that, that God extends to us, um, even though we didn't deserve it. You know, we've all made some stupid choices in life, but yet we ex he extends this grace to us that, that he saves us from death. Even though we deserve it based on what the scripture says for the wages of sin is death. Luke chapter 23, verses 42 to 43. Then he said, this is the second thief. This is the one who had the repentant heart. This is the one who, who saw his need. This is the one who wasn't arrogant, but he was willing to confess. Here's what he said in verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in what? In paradise. Now watch this. This is important for every one of us in here and those watching. He is saved by God's what? Grace. Not by his works. This, this thief in that moment is being saved by God's grace, not through works, but by faith. You are not made right with God by going to church. You're not. You're not made right with God by being a church member. You're not made right with God just by giving of your resources and your tithes and your offerings. You're not made right with God by being a nice person. You're not made right with God by just getting rid of all the bad stuff in your life. You're not made right with God when you stop saying bad words on the golf course. <laughs> 
some of you are like, what, what does that mean? If you ever play golf, you know. You're not made right with God by whatever fill in the blank, whatever it may be. Well, I go three out of four Sundays. I, I, I do this for my kids. My dad was a Sunday school teacher. You're not made right with God as a result of any of those things. You're not made right by God by just being religious. A religious person. The thief couldn't walk the straight and narrow because his feet were bound. The thief couldn't perform any good works because his hands were tied. He couldn't turn over a new leaf because he was dying. He was getting ready to take his last breaths. He couldn't join a church because he couldn't get off the cross. He was not saved by his works, but he was saved by, what's that word again? Grace. Now, as a result of grace, we should desire to do all of those things, but all of those things in himself is not what saves us. It's by God's grace. Psalms 103 in verse 10 says this. God does not treat us as our sins, what? Deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. He does not treat us you, you know, in, 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 in the, based on the mistakes that we've made because we've all deserved death. But because of Jesus, he says that he gives us life and that he doesn't repay us according to our iniquities, according to the mistakes that we've made. But he says this, that he separated my sins as far as the east is from the west and he doesn't hold them against me. Every stupid thing that I've done, every bad decision that you've made, he says that you can be forgiven and it is separated as far as the east is from the west, not to be brought back up, not to be seen. He doesn't hold it against you when you make those mistakes because you receive God's grace. Now the question is, you know, once we've received God's grace, we have to be willing to extend God's grace when people make stupid choices around us. And we're like, man, that was a bad choice. Well, you've made some bad choices too. Well, man, that, you know, they, they tried to hurt me. Well, listen, Jesus was crucified on the cross. And we have to be willing to extend grace. We have to be willing to work towards forgiveness because forgiveness wins. We have to be willing to extend it. Good people, I've said this before, we've taught this before, but but good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. People who've repented, people who are saved. We don't go to heaven because we're good. You get to go to heaven because God is good. And what he's done for you and what he's done for me. And, and here's one of the things that, that I think is so powerful about God's love for us and that, that we should work to extend that type of love to our kids and to others around us but there, here's how good he is, and here's how much he loves you. There's nothing that you can do to make him love you anymore. Let me say that again. <laughs> There's nothing you can do on this planet to make him love you more. Not, well, man, I've went to church so many times. I know God's proud of me and he loves me so much. No, there's nothing you can do. No amount of times you serve, no amount of money that you give, no amount of time that you've given to what, it, there's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. Watch this. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. No matter what. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. Now, is he disappointed? You know, are we separated from him? We can make some bad decisions. Even if you're here and you're not saved, he still loves you. And he still pursues you. But that doesn't get you into heaven. His love extended to you is there, but you have to receive it and accept it in order to receive forgiveness to be able to get to heaven. But there's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. 
It's not because that's what he does, because that's who he is. God is love. God is grace. And he loves you. Instead of sitting on a throne, he was hanging on a cross for you. Instead of wearing a golden crown, he wore a crown of thorns. Why? For you. Instead of being surrounded by servants, he was surrounded by thieves. Why? Because he loved you. He was innocent and he deserved to live, but for us, he was willing to die. Why? Because he loves you. And he desires for you to have a relationship with him. And as a result, he gave his life on the cross. He dies, draws his last breath. We know the earth shook, sky went dark. You know, they were like, surely this is the son of God. Goes into the tomb. Three days later, what happens? He comes back. He's resurrected, man. People are like, they're shocked. They're like, man, what in the world? And, and all of these things are going on. And, and he's defeated the grave. And he's come out. And he's there. And he's getting ready to send back to heaven. And he's preparing everybody. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus when we receive that grace that he extends to us. First Peter chapter one and verse three says, praise be to God and Father our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's the hope that you and I have this morning. Now the question is, where do you align with that thieves? Are, are, are you one that is unrepentant? And, and maybe you've been baptized, but you really didn't mean it. You've never really accepted Christ. And maybe for others, you're like, no, I, I've, I've accepted Jesus and I've repented. But maybe you've made some choices. And you're like, I need to get back to that repentant heart. I need to move back in that direction and get my life lined back up where it needs to be. I don't know where you are this morning, but, but every one of us identifies with one of those two. And, and, and the most important decision we can make is surrendering our life to Jesus and preparing for eternity because eternity far outweighs the little bit of time that you and I have on this earth far outweighs it. This past Friday night, um, one of our church members, one of our, part of our church family, Miss Marianne Bridges, went into the hospital and I uh, saw on social media late Friday night where she had, had went in and Sherry and them had taken her to the hospital and um, she passed away early Saturday morning. Now many of you may already know, but, but their family has been a part of our church literally from the very beginning. Like back to the very beginning when we first planted and we first started their family has been committed and a part of the whole process of our journey many of you may know her from the community um, if you've ever got coffee from the coffee shop she's typically one that's always serving coffee in the coffee shop faithfully serving one of the other things that she was very gifted at doing is anytime we had a special event, she was the one who helped decorate for it. She had a gift and a knack for decorating and, and setting things up. So she oftentimes would help decorate the coffee shop for special events. I'll never forget just a couple of years ago, we did a series here on the stage. And some of you may remember this. How many remember this series called Be Our Guest, where we had a dining room table out here with a, like a feast with all the plates and, the, and it made it look like a big dinner table. Does anybody, anybody remember that? Some of your hands... All right, she's the one who did that whole thing for me. Like she, I called her, I was like, I need a favor. I know this is your gift. Can you help me set up a table? Here's what we want to do. This is a big Easter moment for us. We want to invite people to the table that may have never had the opportunity to be invited. It's opportunities for us to share the gospel. And many people were saved during that series that we had. And she had a big part of the whole visualization of what it looked like on the stage to have it set up like a dinner table. She was always faithful. Well, she passed away this weekend. And so you be praying for the Simmons family and all them that are a part of our church family. Like I said, they're deeply rooted, been here from the very beginning. Um, but I know this. I know Miss Marianne now is, is up in heaven using her gifts and her skills and where she's at. And she's experienced the repentance. She's experienced Jesus as her Savior. It, it's evident in the life that she lived. And we know where she's at now. And I, and I text um, Sherry, and I was telling her, look, look, eternity and the time that we're going to get to spend with our loved ones in eternity far outweighs the time that we'll spend here on earth. I look at my kids, I was thinking about it this weekend and the time that I have with my kids as they're growing up and even though it was a frustrating week, at the same time I know that I won't get that time back. And so I'm, I'm trying to embrace that time with them, embrace the moments I have with my kids, but I, and I realize this, one day they're gonna move out. 
hopefully, eventually. <laughs> one, one day they'll get old enough and want to move out. They'll want to have you know, their, their family and they want to get started. And, and, and God will use them. But, but even in those moments, what eternity looks like with our loved ones versus the time that we have here on earth can't compare. And there's nothing more than I want than my loved ones, my family, and those around me to go to heaven. And I want you to be there with us with our loved ones, with Miss Marianne and others who have passed away, our family who's gone on to heaven. One day we'll all get to be there, but the only way to get there is through Jesus and it's through a repentant heart. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to extend that invitation to you for those watching online as well. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus as your Savior, if you've never truly repented, my prayer is that you would realize the need for a Savior, that you'd realize the need for Jesus, that you would be willing to, to, to come to Him when He calls and to surrender your life to Him and confess Him as Lord. And the Bible says that if we have a repentant heart and we confess, the, the, one of the, the thieves said, hey, will you just remember me in paradise? He was confessing like, I'm desperate for you. I deserve what I get. I'm not asking you to take me off the cross. I'm asking you to take me into eternity because I know that's a lot longer. I know that's permanent. And he prayed and Jesus said, today you'll be with me. My prayer is that you will be prepared for eternity, far beyond just what happens here. Father, I pray for all of us that, that we would all have repentant hearts. Lord, I pray for those that are watching online, Lord, that they would, they would realize their need for you and that even in this moment, even though they may not even be here on campus, they can pray where they're at and surrender their lives to you, Father, and that they can be saved. Lord, I pray that you would um, move in their lives. I pray that we would take the next steps and follow you. And Lord, that we would repent where we need to, get some things right maybe that haven't been right in a while, and we would get back on the track where we need to be as we come to you when you call. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say together, amen. Let's stand to our feet.